that we are cripples in being genuine people before one another. This is to say that w you and I can be fellow pigs without the use of symbols, but to be persons, we are utterly and completely <coughs> dependent upon symbols that mediate, mediate deeps that no kind of immediacy can mediate. Uh, how, how can we recover this? I have resorted to ancient formulae. I shall do it again. Grace be unto you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. It's not there. Uh, well, let's keep you and I keep struggling in our lifetime. Uh, prologue number one. Uh, you must understand, and this is the way I choose to relate myself to you. You must understand that y you alone can l live your own life. My friend Luther stood in his pulpit one day and said something like as follows to his people. When I got borned, you were not there. When you got borned, uh, I was not there. When you get dighted, I'll not be there. And when I get dighted, you'll not be there. Every man must do his getting born and his getting died utterly alone. You have to live your own life. Now, about me. St. Paul one time said, to all of creation, I think he thought he was standing on Mount Everest. As I follow Christ, as I live an authentic existence, so you must follow my pattern and live an authentic existence. As I reflect Christ, he said, so you reflect me. That, I wish to say to you, is exactly my stance in the world. As I follow Christ, so you follow me. That's what I mean to say to you. As I drool with uh, authenticity and integrity, so you follow me as your example. That's what I mean to say to the world. And I mean to shove that at you and the world so hard that they not only understand with their mind, but with their bowels that every man must do his own living and do his own dying alone. Prologue number three has to do with what we're doing here. And I must say to you, uh, yesterday I let loose my pistol and it misfired. It came back and exploded in my face. The reasons for it, I don't need to rehearse now. Therefore, this morning, uh, I just want to go to the blackboard and... Uh, uh, back up and go forward at the same time doing three or four different things and we'll see whether or not it explodes backwards uh, again. But before I start, I have my, my, my poetry, uh, which uh, Lawrence and I wrote. <laughs> oh, <you> two together, <laughs> tell you, he, he never produced these things I produce out here. Uh, we're a team. And uh, <laughs> so uh, also with my friend John, I don't know his last name, he and I wrote a little bit, bit of poetry here that I want to read uh, uh, next. Uh, As we live, and I wish I, I, I wish I were an actor rather than a ham. Uh, so <laughs> uh, but I tell you, words just fascinate me. And if you ever notice those good short Anglo-Saxon words have whole universes in them? You have. <laughs> <laughs> all right, I didn't think that you were that kind of a girl at all. <laughs> <laughs> it's that word live. How, how, do you, how do you say it, you know, in which... In which uh, Four letters, uh, just, uh, uh, you know, just breathe, uh, just bleed. Uh, as we live, we are the transmitters of life. And when we fail to transmit life, life fails to flow through us. That is a part of the mystery of sex. It is a flow onward. Sexless people transmit nothing. 
And if, as we work, we can transmit life into our work, life and still more life rushes into us to compensate, to be ready. And we ripple with life through the days, even uh, if it is a woman making an apple dumpling or a man a, a stool. If life goes into the pudding, good is the pudding. Good is the stool. Content is the woman with fresh life rippling into her. Content is the man. Give and it shall be given unto you is still the truth about life. But giving life is not so easy. It doesn't mean handing it out to some poor, mean fool or letting the living dead eat you up. It means kindling the life quality where it was not even if it's only in the whiteness of a washed handkerchief. You like that? What, 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 wouldn't you like to have that power that every time you moved your hand across another's eyes they could see? And every time you touch them, blue life they never dreamed of, wouldn't, huh? huh? Well, damn it, you've got to be alive to do that. To unstop those ears. <laughs> huh? To unblock that tongue. Now John and I, Sometime later came one of the feast days and Joshua went up to Jerusalem. There's in Jerusalem near the Sheep Gate a pool surrounded by five arches. And under these arches a great many sick people were in the habit of lying. Some of them were blind, some were deaf, some were lame. They used to wait there for the moving of the water. For, for certain times an angel used to come down into the pool and disturb the water. And after the disturbance, the person who stepped into the water first would be healed of whatever he was suffering from. One particular man had been ill for 38 years. That's just one year less than Jack Benny is old. <laughs> and when Joshua saw him lying there on his back, Knowing he'd been there for a long time, he said to him, Don't you want to get well? <laughs> Sir, replied the sick man, I just haven't got anybody to put me in the pool when the water's all stirred up. While I'm trying to get there, somebody else beats me to it. Get up, said Joshua. Get up. Pick up the bed of your life and walk. That's John and I. <laughs> I want to deal with uh, the Christ event and secondly with the Christ story and thirdly with the Christ drama. That's what I want to try to do very quickly. Now, yesterday, I was attempting to talk about life in terms of what I call the edge of life. And I came at that in terms, it seems to me, of the two ways in which any man meets it, and that's in terms of the emptiness of life, which you and I know about, and then the frightening, overwhelming fullness of life, or just the thereness of what is in a, 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 a life. Now, let this little circle represent all of those structures uh, of the civilizing process in and which you and I uh, find ourselves <coughs> at home. And yesterday I talked about that life situation in which you and I get shoved to the very perimeter of the total context in which any man can find himself rooted in significance. That edge of life. Now within here there are all kinds of course of complexes 
uh, little games. This is to say that the man who knows what you and I know knows that every man lives by faith in some God, in something that bestows significance on his life. If it isn't mama, uh, uh, then it's uh, gold water. And if it isn't uh, gold water, it's uh, liberalism. And if it isn't liberalism, it's the damn Methodist church. <laughs> and if it isn't the damn Methodist church, it's... Uh, and uh, you see, uh, 50 years ago, people raised the question as to whether or not there's a God. That kind of a question is as anachronistic as most anything. You always spot a guy who either is fleeing from life or is naive beyond almost wanting to pay any attention to him when he raises the question of, is there a God? The kind of a universe in which you can raise that question hasn't existed for a long time. The, the problem in the spirit of man it today is that he's aware there are so damn many gods he doesn't know what to do with them. That's his problem. And therefore the spirit question of his life is which God is God which is to say which God am I going to get myself born before and get myself died before? That is which one of the not meannesses in life am I finally going to do my living before? That's the question. Not whether there's a God. Now, I spoke yesterday of finally the failure of all of these things. You remember that time uh, when really Mama collapsed off of the pedestal for you? Or hasn't she yet? I can almost remember eh, the time when it happened for me. Mama sent me to the door, which she had done many times to tell somebody was knocking she wasn't there. And uh, it finally dawned on, 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 on that, uh, I say a little lad, I think he was about up like this. I had a hard time getting loose from my mama, I suppose. Uh, anyway, I say to myself, she's a damn liar. <laughs> <laughs> The amazing thing for you who are still in diapers, see, when mama cracks uh, 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 and therefore is delivered he, from the phony universe you stuck her in, because mark you, my mama always was a damn liar. I, I mean that she was a creature. Uh, she was a temporality. He. Uh, the worms, uh, they're going to polish her off just like they did Plato or Kant. Uh, it, uh, when this happens, there you've got a genuine hunk of flesh and blood you can relate to. Do you understand that? I tell you, it doesn't always, you know, happen so dramatically. As a matter of fact, it didn't for me. Uh, I, uh, 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 <laughs> I, being an upright a Methodist clergyman, to say nothing of having been conditioned in a moralistic uh, mm, mm, type of, of childhood, uh, 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 used to hide from my mama that I smoked. And it became finally ridiculous, you know, because mama knew I smoked, and I knew I smoked, and I knew that mama knew I smoked, and <laughs> mama knew that I knew that she knew that I knew that she smoked. And hell, it got <laughs> And I was going along, oh, I, I was bigger than I ought to have been. Uh, uh, I was going along one day driving mama in a car, you know. And uh, I say, it's now or never. And I say, now, Mama, uh, you're uh, pretty old now, aren't you? Yes, I'm old. I, you're not going to live too long, are you? And she says, <laughs> well, likely not. And I said, well, isn't it time that you and I really become human beings before one another? And uh, she looks at me, you know. She never knows what to expect. And, uh, <laughs> so I say, now, uh, over there in the glove compartment of my cigarettes, and I think you ought to be the one who hand them to me. And she looked at me for a little bit, and uh, she uh, reached over and, you know, got the... I tell you, Mom and I, we've been new people ever since. Do you grasp this kind of thing? Well, shall I rehearse the collapse of Methodism? Hey. Huh? Shall I collapse that awareness when you finally become aware of the fact hey, that the Presbyterian, uh, the Methodist Church wasn't always here and uh, will not always be here? And when you see that, it's already gone uh, forever and never. And, and <laughs> it's already gone. It no longer could ever be the meaning of your life. The crack is taking place. The pedestal is broken. And when you see that the United States of America wasn't always here and isn't always going to be here, it's already gone and forever and forever. Do you understand this? Which is to say that I'm working up here to this edge. When you see that everything that is is in that same predicament. Do you get this? That everything passes away. 
that your most favorite theologian. I used to think when I was down at Perkins that once a year they ought to get all of the faculty up on the stage and uh, have them turn sideways and then they strip stark naked for the student body so that they could see our pot bellies and our flabby muscles, see, and that therefore they would never take us serious ever again as anything except human beings that the worms uh, uh, would eat see, like they have eaten every theologian in the past. Do you get that story? That's what I'm talking about by the edge of light where lucidity breaks in, period. Now, what are you up against? Well, I don't know what you're up against. You don't know what you're up against. And nobody else ever knew what they were up against. As a student, you used to say, well, I'm, I'm just up against a great question mark. I had another student who said, I'm just up against what the hell? Any name you put on it, hey, that's it. The great mystery. The great mystery. And in that awareness, you become aware, therefore, that your basic relationship which constitutes you as a person is the relationship to the great unknown. And unknown. Now, this isn't some kind of doctrine. <laughs> it's not some kind of philosophy. Hell, it's just the way life is. And at this point, the only real decision anybody ever had to make sticks up this nasty head. The only real decision anybody ever has to make sticks up its head. And that's finally how you're going to live your life and die your death. And you get but one chance, not two. If I'd have been God, they, I'd have given everybody two times round so that they could have played with the first and then the next time come back sober. That's not the way things showed up. Now, it's exactly at this point, and only at this point, that the question of God in depth is ever raised. If you're sitting around here nursing off a of mama, Methodism, Plato, Tilly, Matthews, uh, Boldwater, uh, Kennedy, if you're uh, suckling off of uh, any of uh, these, you have never raised the question of God, not of God. It's raised only here. And it's only at this point where the question of God is raised for you. I mean the question of God is raised for you that the Christ word has any relevance whatsoever. The gospel of Jesus Christ has no meaning. It's like it's like um, e, e, um, um, e. say when you stand here. When you stand there, then you become aware of the relevance of what we symbolically call the word. Now, let's see if we can make this practical for just a minute. You've uh, met my wife a little bit. She's literally the wrath of God upon me because she knows where my gizzard is. I was sitting at breakfast this morning with a very bright, uh, scrubbed behind the ear uh, young man uh, in our uh, group who was slopping over with sentimentalism. So I thought I would test him out by uh, having him tell me where the gizzard of a man across the table was. He failed to test something colossally. Well, my wife knows where my gizzard is. See, I, I mean, if the gizzard in man is the illusion-making faculty, she knows more about my illusions than anybody in this uni universe. And at times, she waxes bold to stick a knife at him. That's why she's the wrath of God upon me. But the wrath of God is always God's love. Not that God's love comes sometimes and his wrath sometimes, or his... Mercy comes after his wrath. No, no, no. His wrath is his mercy. That is, you haven't any, you haven't the slightest chance of being other than who you are until some uh, over against us in life takes you and shakes you till your teeth rattles. For only when you die do you live. 
I say my wife is the wrath of God, who's always calling into question my illusion. I remember a student that I had one day who said that he came home to his wife after having a great theological dialogue he, over in the library with some of his colleagues, and he came waddling home in the image of being really an on-the-edge theologian, only to be met at the door he, by his frau, who uh, pulled out her hat pit and very quickly reminded him that he was not he, a on-the-edge theologian. He was a 30-minute late babysitter who was supposed to have been there so she could go to the store. Do you understand my picture? Now, when these negations move in, sometimes in these negations, sometimes I am hurled out to the edge where I see the not before everything, but not always. And especially as I grow more sophisticated and more lucid, it's really harder to get to me. You, you see, the moment that somebody moves in on your life, you have to kill them. You know that, don't you, hey? To protect yourself. Now, there's laws against literally slitting wives' throats. They put you in gas chambers for things like that. So us subtle people, we learn how to destroy and kill with a kindness or, a, you know, in subtle... I remember I had a group of students out to my house one night and we were sitting around and I was just scintillating all over the place. And uh, Lynn uh, stood up and uh, started out and said, Joseph, I will see you in the kitchen. Now, when my mama or my wife <laughs> calls me Joseph, I feel guilty to begin with. I, I know I've done something wrong. And so, without knowing how I was threatened, I was already sharpening my knife. And I moved toward the kitchen and started out Lynn, you can't do this to me. He, tomorrow I'm their professor. I've got to stand up and be be their professor. You can't humiliate me by ordering me around in my house like this. She says, Joseph, faith. Uh, you know, women were given weapons. Uh, they used them all their life, and they're damned effective. And sooner or later, if you're going to live with one, you're going to come to terms with them. Hey, you, you get that picture, too, I, 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 I suppose. Well, I know you know I have other ways, like, well, I don't care what I did. Hey, I can name things that you did that were worse than... <laughs> I see that I don't need to belabor that. <laughs> You're more skilled than I am. But when, so to speak, I can't succeed in destroying... Oh, Mark, you, at this conference, I tell you, I'm just a ready-built scapegoat for you. You know, because I'm eccentric to begin with, you can write Matthews off as a crackpot, eh? as an oddball. Eh? I've just given you the tool, haven't you, huh? Well, I'll expect some letters of appreciation. <laughs> They usually start out, uh, Dear Brother Joseph, you are a horse's ass. <laughs> That's the thank you letters, you know, that I, not that I, 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 I get with this. But when you are not able to destroy the intrusion in your life, you're thrown out here to the very edge where you see the collapse of the collapse of the collapse, for there you stand utterly naked without any justification, without any excuse for having showed up in history. I say it's at that point that the word becomes relevant. Now, this word, it seems to me, in terms of what happens to me, first I experience as a seizure, and secondly I experience as an offense, and thirdly I experience as a decision, uh, uh, a deadly decision, I might add there. And what I mean by that is that in those moments, a word that is latently in my memory breaks out of my latent memory <coughs> into my active memory and addresses me. It's a word like, uh, like, Joseph, you're significant. Now, mark you, I'm standing there naked as a jaybird, eh? caught, trapped, eh? uh, uh, unveiled, eh? and that word moves in. Joseph, your life is, your life is utterly significant. And I say, who, me? It, it, it's that kind of a state. Eh? That you're it. Your life is utterly significant. Uh, Wesley said that it was something like this, that you carry within your mind an abstract idea that God so loved the world, and that in a situation like this, your name appears on that word. It's like, Joseph, your life is significant. 
That's what I mean by the seizure. It becomes relevant. And as a matter of fact, at this point, it becomes the only relevant word. That is to say, at that point, you are haunted with the awareness that, my God, if that isn't the word, there isn't any word. And at that moment, you don't give one damn where that word broke into history. It might ver just as well have come in from the braying of a jackass in 1846 on the south slope of the Alps. Do you understand that? At that moment, there isn't any question of who in the hell first said that word, because that's the only word that can have meaning. And what Nietzsche saw very clearly, that if that isn't the word, then you've got to write a no off of this and either spend the rest of your life, and I'm going to swear real hard, because you who don't swear, swear down in your guts when you take this stand. You go through life saying this goddamn universe, or else you conjure up a new rosy illusion like the characters in the Iceman Cometh, in which you pretend that you don't know what you damn well know, and then the cussing comes out through the form of colitis, mm, ulcers, migrate ticks, eccentricities, uh, slavism. Do you understand this? At that point, wherever that word came from, it is the one word that has relevance. That's what I mean by seizure. But there's a sneakiness in this seizure. Let's say that here I am seized by that word as that which has possibility for my existence in the deeps. That word is the kind of a word that is an utter offense so that it strikes you and knocks you outside of yourself so that you are able to see old Joseph over there being seized. And yet here is Joseph seeing Joseph being seized and seeing that it's a scandalous seizure, and the reason why it's scandalous, because of intellectual and emotional, emotional and in, in, in intellectual insecurity raised to the nth power. Now see if I can put some flesh and blood on it. Now, when you are seized, the scandal that causes the gap is first of all, the intellectual scandal of who said so of who said so. Now I've already pointed to that in a way, but now you face it head on. Here I am seized with the only word that has relevance, and now I want three good reasons. Do you see this? This is what it means to be a rational preacher. But at this time, you see none of this helps. If I say, Paul say so, at this point I know damn well that the worms are going to eat Paul Tilly like they're eating me. Do you see this? It doesn't do any good to say, my, my dear friend Wolfer, he says so, because hell Luther uh, went the way too. It doesn't do any good to say, the Bible says so, uh, because uh, that's exactly the problem. And certainly it doesn't do any good to say, my eschatological hero, Jesus, he says so, because the very problem here is who in the hell is Joshua? Do you see this? And if I give you three good reasons why A is better than B, then you aren't interested in A being better than B. You're interested in where in the wide world does a guy get three good reasons? You see this. This is at that point where you make your final beginning out of which you build any three good reasons that you have. That's the kind of a decision that is to say that the man who stands at this point is the man who is one step out beyond any cynic. He's out one step beyond any skeptic. He's the one who in principle has in his awareness every doubt that's possible in the whole universe. Maybe one day you're going to see that the Christian faith is not to take care of those neurotics that can't handle their neuroses in the midst of the world, but that the Christian faith is that self-understanding that shows a man to the limits beyond which there is no move. That's what I'm trying to articulate. And the emotional insecurity is, the other side of that coin, the emotional insecurity is that this man who dares to stand here or say yes to that word knows that no mama can ever be a womb for him again, that no political cause 
can they ever give him security again? That no religious institution can ever again give him, that no friendship can take away the anxieties? He knows at this point that he's either, and I want to swear again, he's got to become, and I mean this as genuine swearing, he's got to become a goddamn liar. If he's going to get any security, he's got to build a lie that is a damning of God into the core of his being, hidden behind illusions that he knows are illusions. That's the emotional insecurity. And you little old mice as you who subscribe to the bourgeois philosophy dressed up in Christian terminology that is seen, Christianity is a matter of security. No, no. That's the Christianity that denies Christianity. The man of faith, seized and offended by this word, is out over 70,000 fathoms of insecurity for the rest of his being. That's the offense. That's why that nobody ever heard this word, save their life collapsed to the bottom. And then the third part of the analysis of the dynamics of faith is the decision. And I mean here a decision. I mean a decision not over nothing. I mean the kind of decision that doesn't have three reasons for deciding. I mean the decision that has nothing as a basis for deciding. I mean the kind of decision in which the decision itself is the gamble of your own existence which goes around the clock once. It's the kind of a decision in which your guts are the, your guts are the guts of the decision. Which is to say that the word never comes to a person as truth. Good Lord, no, that's the problem. The word comes to you as a possibility which is a question, which forces you to answer the question as to whether or not you're going to live in the deeps of humanness or whether you're going to live in the lying, secure shallows of humanness. The word does not come as a truth. It comes as a possibility, which is a question that addresses the very bottom of everything you mean by yourself and this world. You have to answer that question. And you have to answer it out of enough. And the cost of it is your whole being. It's that kind. It's as if the man of faith picks up every doubt in the universe. This is why he outskepticizes the skeptic. The skeptic knows nothing that he doesn't know. The tragic hero knows nothing that he does not know. The most Lewis lucid stoic knows nothing that he does not know. The existentialist who looks nothingless square in the eye knows nothing he does not know. This man knows everything that's to be known in the universe, period. He takes every doubt, every question mark in the civilizing process and takes it into his own being. That's the decision of faith. And he takes every emotional insecurity. This is to say, this man can be surprised by nothing. He takes every insecurity into himself. Even Mr. Goldwater in the White House. Yes, and that's not funny. Even somebody pushing that at button. Every insecurity in the universe he takes into his own bowels. That's the decision out over nothing at the point of this word. Now, let me see if I can get a little more flesh and blood on that word. It's been put in history so many ways. That word of Augustine, that word was, all it is is good. When he knew damn well anybody with two ounces of sense 
that knew this world wasn't good? All it is, that's a confessional statement, not a metaphysical one. Luther, I have said to you, put it before God, no man is a faith. I mentioned to some of you the trees talked to me. I used to have an office down in Austin, Texas, and the students at the university would come in and talk to me and pull out, pour out their troubles. And I tell you, the students at Texas really had bellies full of problems. And I'd sit there and listen to them like I, I'd never heard things like that my whole life until it got so damn painful that all I could think of was my own problems. And when I got to thinking about my own problems, I'd sort of turn away just a little bit or trying to pretend they didn't. I wasn't hearing a damn thing they said. I was just consumed with my own problem. And then I'd look out that window and across the street there was a tree and that tree was a friend of mine. I was a strange old tree. You know, in Texas they have cyclones or whatever they call them. And some of the limbs of this tree were, were knocked off, you, you know. And there was a great big gash down through its psyche, psyche. I mean its trunk. And they had that black stuff patching it up. You, you, it wasn't long for this world. And the students would come by and they would, would pay no attention to it. And even faculty members would walk right by that, that tree, my friend, and literally ignore it. And then in these circumstances, that tree used to speak to me. And it would say, don't you, you get to, I'm not psychotic. Augustine went around and asked all the little flowers in the universe if the meaning of life was in them. In those days, flowers could talk. And they all said, no, it's not in me. This tree talks. He'd start out, he'd say, hello, Joseph. He'd always call me Joseph. <laughs> uh, he'd say, hello, Joseph. And I'd say, hello, tree. And uh, the tree would start in saying, uh, uh, look, uh, I'm accepted in this universe. And I'd say, what? You mean with uh, those stubby old limbs of yours? Say, yes, I'm received in the universe. And I say, with that great big gash down through your psyche that you're never going to get over and you're going to carry it. He says, yes, I'm received with that big gash in my psyche. And, and, and I say, even though nobody pays you no mind, yes, I'm re I say, how do you know that? And, and the tree says to me, look. And sure enough, I'd look. And whatever was sustaining anything in being was sure as hell sustaining my friend in being over there, just as he was. And then the tree would be sneaky, turn it around on me. He'd say, why, Joseph, you're received in this universe. I'd say, what do you mean? You mean this guy that can't even stand the pain of listening to this poor needy? He says, yes. You mean this guy who never was quite what his papa wanted him? Yes. You mean this fella who never quite made it like his brother made it? Yes. You mean this guy who's done all of these horrible things that you know damn well? He says, yes. And I say, how do you know? And he says, look. And sure enough, I look down. And there I am. And whatever is sustaining anything in this universe is that they're sustaining me, whether you like me or not. <laughs> Boy, that, you know, that's where I've got you by the tail. Whether you like me or not, whether um, my mama cares for me, whether or not my wife um, delights in me, whether or not I approve of myself, by whatever finally is going on in this universe, Joseph Wesley Matthews, as he is, not as he might have been, not as you think he ought to be, not as he might like to be, but exactly as he is, is pronounced utterly received. That's John 3.16. That's the word that seizes you as a possibility. But you see, it's not your word until you say, I am the one who is utterly approved in this universe. And then, that word is the word of my life, is the anchor of my existence. And if you ask me, who says so, then I say, I say so. And only after I say, I say so, do I say, we say so, which means Mrs. Big Bottom and I. You understand that? Which means Luther and I. Which means Paul and I. Which means Amos and I. Which means Bill Steele and I. That's the Christ happening. And our fathers had, had, had many wonderful perils by which they spoke of it. They said, one time I was maimed. All my life I was maimed, but didn't know I was maimed. I thought I was a two-armed man with one arm. 
or a two-legged man with one leg. All my life I was maimed. Now, lo, in this happening, I am whole. All my life I've been blind, is what they said. Oh, I thought I could see. But I was blind, and now I see. All my life I've been deaf. Now I hear. All my life I've been tongue-tied, and now I can speak. All my life I've been in chains, and now I'm free. All my life, and this was their great symbol, I've been a cadaver. I've been dead. And lo, now I am alive. I've been resurrected from the dead. And the strange little irony of this is that what I have described here is nothing short of death in the deepest meaning of death. Here I die to all of those illusions which seemed alone to give me life. And when I died to those illusions and became nothing over 70,000 fathoms of water, who in his nothingness was approved by the cosmos, then I discovered, I say when I died and was left, I discovered that was my life. I had my life from the beginning but I did not know I had my life, and therefore I did not live. Now the Christ happening isn't something that took place 2,000 years ago. The Christ happening is something that happens now in your life where it doesn't happen, and there's nothing religious about it. There is nothing pious about it. There is nothing dogmatic about it. It's as human as going to the toilet. Period. Now, your next question, and mark you, this is your next question. This was your first question. Your next question is, how can these things be? How can these things be? And when you and I step back from this happening and try to think and talk about it, we become aware that we cannot speak to ourselves about how these things can be, save we tell the story of our life, which is the story of the community in which we are when this happening has become the happening in and through which we define ourselves in history. That is the story of the church. Now, when you come to us who are the church and ask us to talk about how this can be, you find us lying like sailors. That is to say, these, these people who've embraced their insecurity, you find to be the most insecure people you ever saw. And when you ask them, they lie like sailors. They begin to give you three good psychological reasons why this is true, and three good philosophical reasons why this is true, and three good Marxist reasons why this is true. And yet when you yank the rug out from under them each time, which you have to do, because in God they're insecure, these people. Uh, uh, when you yank the rug out and you drive them into the corner, and finally you get them squatted down there with their, 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 their head between their knees and their hands over their head, they'll finally say, all right, all right, all right, I'll tell you the story of my life. And when they do, they tell a story something like this. One time we be not, we not be, and then a configuration of happenings at the center of which was one Joshua, I say a configuration of occurrences occurred, after which here we be, do you see that? They say at one time in history we had no being. And after a configuration of circumstances, here we be. It's sort of like the Revolutionary War. If you ask us who we are, and we finally tell the story, we say, well, one time we were not, and there was a complex of circumstances that we loosely refer to as the Revolutionary War, after which, here we is. Here we is. Now, at the center of between the not being and the being, I say remember that the term 
Jesus Christ is not the first and the last name of a character. The term Christ is a title, like Harry Truman, the president. So you have Jesus plus the Christ equals this happening or event. And this Christ is the significance uh, for human existence. What I'm trying to say is that in and about some Joe Blow, about whom we know next to nothing, a new significance in terms of grasping what it means to be a human being apparently belched into history. I said that when you stand up here at this point, it doesn't make any difference how that came into history, whether it came from the braying of a jackass in 1482, but scientifically, apparently, and that's what you always have to say, this self-understanding, this possibility for being human broke in and into history in and about a character named Joshua or Jesus. But what broke into being was the self-understanding, which is to say the Christ self-understanding or the possibility of the Christ happening, happening in history. And out of this happening, these people wove a tremendous story. And I want to deal a little bit with that story. I've never read a story like it. Maybe that's because it's my story. I mean, it's the story behind all of the stories in life that give meaning to my being Joseph Wesley Matthews. And the story looks a little like this. Now, you've got to go back and get their stage setting. You've got to see in Broadway. I remember years ago, I saw a play on Broadway called Eternal Rope. And, oh, hey, by the way, old Amy Semple McPherson years ago in Los Angeles wrote an opera, she said she did, and there were three stage levels, earth, heaven, and hell there, and I went to see it, uh, uh, and it was rather a phenomenal thing. Anyway, on this stage, there's two levels. Now, this level here, and maybe I ought to draw it like this, represents the civilizing process, or history, if you please. This level up here represents uh, uh, the cosmic, in the poetic sense of that. Uh, it represents the ultimate. It represents uh, the final meaning of life. That's what this stage represents. Now, these strange people, the church, to whom uh, this thing happened, this new self-understanding, this uh, awareness that they had divine permission to be human beings with all of the, of the creatureliness that that meant, these people built two basic symbols. And those two symbols, in my opinion, are the omega, that's really the empty tomb, and of the cross, which is to say that when a man dies, I mean dies to all his pretensions about life, he discovers that he's resurrected, that he's alive, that he lives, that he really is human, uh, to put it in another way. Our father never separated these two symbols. This was what happened in history, those two symbols. And when they took their story to try to, to say to themselves and the world that this is not just another significance <coughs> or that this isn't just one among many happenings, but it's the final happening in the sense that this is the utter depths of the meaning of humanness when they tried to write that story. What a story. First of all, they took these two symbols and put them up on the cosmic level and then shoved the cosmic level in the play back to the beginning of the beginnings. Now, to get this scene, this little episode in the play, you have to go back to those primordial moments, you know. The Jews in the first chapter of Genesis have a great picture of it. You remember in the little play there, they waddle old Yahweh in on the stage and have him uh, hurl out a little bit of isness, and at the end of the day, he steps back and says it's good. And then they waddle him out a second day and have him throw out a little more isness, he, and he says it's good. And when he wraps it all up, it took him seven days to get through that little that dramatic episode. When he, he, he got all the isness going, he stepped back and said it's very good. What a play. What a play. What a play. What? If, if you see that scene, old Pop is sitting on the throne back here in this scene. That means the ultimate up againstness in life. And... Guess what's sitting on his lap? Well, it's a little baby wham. 
Now, just to be sure, just to be sure that you don't get this mixed up with any antiquated literalism, it's a wham. I want you to understand that that wham represents this symbol right here, that if a man die to any pretensions, he lives. That's what it represents. And to be sure that you get that symbolism that they use right, this little lamb, as it hopped along, said, bah, 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 bah. Now, you've got the picture in the play we're writing. And this little lamb, back in the primordial moment, was sitting on the lap of the papa. What a play. And guess what? In this play, the little old lamb is the one who hurled into being all isnesses. Do you get that picture? And in this, our papas were saying that this self-understanding is the cosmic self-understanding that was there from the very beginning. Whatever that means mythologically. And you and I have it the foggiest because it's a mythological concept. Now, let's go to the other se se scene of this play. Golly, this ought to be on Broadway, I think. <laughs> now, now, this is the pre-existence of the Christ happening. Now we go to the post-existence. And when the play wraps up... What time is that? Is it? When, uh, when, uh, when, uh, when the play wraps up, uh, and, and history is all rolled up, whatever in the hell that means, You've got the old papa, of course, sitting on the throne. But guess who's on his lap? Why, the little lamb is on there. And guess who is the one who gets to say whether this whole play was good or bad? Guess who? The lamb gets to do that in the play. It's a lamb that was slain before the foundation of the world. And it's a lamb that's still dripping with blood. And the lamb is the one who decided what the play was about. And it's the lamb, hello, who decides whether the play was good. Can you understand this? Can you understand that? Do you understand why, for me, it's a matter of utter life and death that I live in the word, that I have cosmic approval, that I live in the Christ word? Nothing religious about it. Nothing supernatural about it. Nothing philosophical about it. Nothing dogmatic about it. It's just the way life is. Now, you've got a couple of tremendous little transitional scenes uh, in the play. First of all, they had to get the lamb he, into history. They had to get him into human form, you know, so that he didn't say, bah, 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 he, but so he, 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 he said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. And, and, and they had to get the has eschatological hero in. Now, uh, they did it through that tremendous scene, the virgin, virgin birth. W wouldn't you like to put that on, huh? Wouldn't you like to put that on there? And if it were in our day, of course, it would not have been that. How would we have gotten the little lamb in? Come on. We well, sure wouldn't have done it with a virgin birth, my God. Flying saucer. Oh, yeah, a flying saucer. That's right. <laughs> he, wouldn't have been, he wouldn't have been a little old lamb. He'd have been a little old green man from Mars. Do you understand that? We didn't write the play. It was written long ago. That's the play with the land. Anyway, here he was, hurled into being on a, uh, on a, uh, on a virgin. He wrote a virgin in that. <laughs> and well, this is to say that you no more could get along without the episode of the virgin birth in the play than you could fly to the moon. Yeah, that's pretty good, fly to the moon. Uh, and then they had to get him out. And uh, I sort of like the way they got him out. I like this better over here. Seemed to me a little more drama in it. Hey. Uh, you know, when I was a little boy, I lived in Ada, Ohio. And, uh, <laughs> and I went to Sunday school one, one day, and they had that picture of the Ascension. And, and you know, they've got this guy about halfway up in the picture. He's on his way. And, uh, and I came uh, home that afternoon and went out to the edge of Ada in just a little knoll. And I, uh, you may think I'm, I was crazy. But anyway, I, I tried it, and I never made it. But I was trying to say, what in the hell? What, what the, well, I never made it. Uh, but the, this is a tremendous scene in which I go out this way. The meaning of existence beats the rap of the worms, and that's all that beats the rap of the worms. Do you see this? Now, the real question is, what in the devil does this mean, this play, mean for Joseph Wesley Matthews? Here's the self-understanding that was, that was the Christ. 
in the sense that it was the cosmic, and it was Jesus, this was the earliest creed, Jesus the Christ, our Lord, and it was the Lord, which is to say that this community bowed its knee before this self-understanding, and, and, and the virgin birth pointed to the Lordship, the early scene to the Lordship, the ascension to the Lordship, the post-existence to the Lordship, but what does that mean? to this unique, unrepeatable fellow in the 20th century. Well, whatever else it means. It means that when I dare to receive the negations of my life and appropriate afresh the word that I am received, that is to say, when, when the word intrudes in the flesh of my concrete situation, when the incarnation takes place for me, in that moment, I become aware afresh that from the beginning, that word was over my life, even though I never heard it. That is to say, my whole memory is reconstructed, including the times that my papa beat the daylights out of me for not shelling beans as fast as my brother. Do you understand how that scarred my being? And can you understand how I'm not over it yet? And can you understand that something has happened to it because at least I can talk about it to myself? Can you understand hey, that I am enabled to say that which is obviously is not good, is nevertheless good, but it's mine? That all my life I have been an utterly approved man. From this moment I know it. But not only do I have a memory, I have a capacity to anticipate that is to say, shove into the darkness of the future. And when I'm able to receive my life as significance, then I am able to grasp, first of all, that I haven't the slightest idea of what the future is going to be. I may be dead in five moments. I may have one leg tomorrow. But there is one thing I'm aware of. That's what this means. That the cosmic going on this, of this world shall pronounce my life approved, approved under any circumstances. This is to say, if I show up tomorrow as a one-legged man, I shall be accepted in the universe as a one-legged man and dare to live my one-leggedness to the hill. And if tomorrow I am given the gift of my death, I shall grasp the fact that dead as well as alive, my existence is approved, and therefore can pick up my death and die it. That's what this strange story means. This is why. This is the story. This is the play without which history is not in the deepest sense history. This is why. This is the story without which no human being in the deepest sense is ever a human being. This is to say the story isn't true because it's better than some other story. Hell, you see the joke of that. But this is the story which is the last story. I mean, there's no place else to go. I mean, this is the end of the road eh, of meaning. I mean, this is the final deeps of humanness. That's why it has to die in permission before God and discovers that in that permission to die, in his dying, he lives and can stand exposed before the white hot insecurity of nothingness itself. And in the third act, therefore is able to take up his life and plunge it into the deeps of concern for the whole civilizing process. That's the drama that you and I as men of faith live by that communicates to us our self-understanding. I remember in Raisin in the Sun, that movie was a great movie, but they left out the punchline of the play. And that was when the African Negro man asked the American Negro girl to marry him and go back to Africa. With amazing lucidity, the Negro girl reminded him of all of the uncertainties, all of the contingencies, all of the inhumanities, all of the tragedies, all of the dyings that awaited them if they went to Africa. And then she turned to him, what's your answer to all these questions? And his reply was, on the floorboard, I intend to live my answer. 
And so I say to you, the Christ happening, the Christ story, the Christ drama in worship is that which gives me final permission to be the living embodiment of answers that I hurl into the face of the questions of the universe. That's what it means to be a Christian. That's what it means in the 20th century to be a man of faith. And the rest of you little old mices, get the hell out. And I'm overdone. <laughs>